What could this life bring to us, Lord? Thank you that you are great, that we can trust in you, Lord, with our greatest needs. Trust in you, Lord, with the, the greatest fears and concerns that might come. Lord, we pray for those, Lord, among our body who are sick. We pray those, Lord, for those who are suffering with, with ailments that are, are leading them down the, the, that valley of the shadow of death, Lord Jesus. We pray that your hand would be with them, that you bring healing and restoration supernaturally. And more than that, God, and along with that, we pray that you would bring peace, that supernatural peace that passes understanding, that, that can't just be from our own thinking, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this body of believers that you brought together, Lord. This, this group that have, have chosen to fellowship together. Let's help us to strengthen one another in faith and strengthen one another, Lord, in love, that we might encourage each other even as the day draws closer. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's so good to see everyone here today. Uh, we can start to see that summer is starting to uh, wrap up because everybody's here at the same time. See, so, you know, I remember, past, I remember uh, when I was pastoring out in East Texas, people would ask me, how many, pa how many people are you running in your church? I said, well, I'm running about 150, but I can only get about 75 there at a time. Um, but it's sure, sure good to see everybody back, back in, 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 the, in the sanctuary today. And uh, what, we're going to take just a few, we'll take a few minutes here for fellowship. Before we do, in the seat back in front of you, if you're a first-time visitor, if you haven't been here before, or if you haven't been here in a long time, Fill out one of these little cards that's there. Just give your name, address, just a contact information, email, so we can follow up about your visit. And um, you can put that, well, we're going to be receiving the offering during our time of fellowship. You can put it in one of those buckets back there. Or if you'd prefer to, you can wait till the end of service. And there's a little desk out there. You can bring that desk. We'd like to give you a greeting, give you a little gift there as well. So fill out one of those. And otherwise, let's spend some time in fellowship and worship. Amen. No. 
for the hope in his name and the power that saves my king is known by the cross my king is known by an empty grave when all that he does my king This has to be the friendliest church I've ever been to. You guys, you could greet until 12.30, and then you want to get out by 12.35. So uh, if you'll find your way back to your seats, we would appreciate that. One last hug until after service.
Amen. 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 Thank you, worship team, for all your hard work. I know I see all the different days that they practice and getting this uh, platform all ready, and we just appreciate all that you all do. Thank you, Don. Well, for those of you that don't, that don't remember or don't know, Pastor Patterson had a knee surgery on Tuesday morning, so that's why he's not here. Um, we do have a, a guest, and it's unusual for us to introduce a staff member, but since this is only his second Sunday here, and um, he came to work Monday, and then Pastor was gone all week, you know, he's been kind of thrown into it real fast, and I um, wanted to give you a little bit of a background to him, and, and kind of help him be calm and be ready to go, but uh, our new staff member, who's our associate pastor, is Mitchell White. His wife is Katie, and they have two children, Charles and Evelyn, and a third one that's coming soon. So I hope they don't name them coming soon, because that's what I put it as. So um, Mitchell's from Lawrence, Kansas, and Katie's from Austin, Texas, and they met at Southwestern Bridal College, no, Bible College, <laughs> Southwestern Assemblies of God. You know, that was a big joke. Um, you know, it goes on. Uh, I think you came in two, 2006, and I knew him back then. So it's always fun to see students grow up and mature. He was the student, student government president, and so I had to work with him uh, because of being director of media services and things. He was one of those that I liked working with. Some of the Student presidents aren't quite as organized, aren't quite there, but he was one of the good ones, so thank you. I don't know if I ever told you that at the time. Um, he's been a youth pastor for 12 years, uh, six years in Middle Othian at Gateway, and then six years at First Assembly in Dallas. His wife is the business manager at Southwestern. Um, he's received, I think they both received your degrees from Southwestern, and he also has a master's from Southwestern. So let's make him feel welcome as we hear from our new staff member, Pastor Mitchell White. That's good. Thank you. All right. Well, I am excited to be here. Uh, we did come in 2006. I met my wife in 2007. Uh, we met, we started dating right before the semester ended in the spring, and then we both went home for the summer. So most of our beginning of our relationship was uh, over the phone, which is not common these days. Well, I guess it is common, but usually they're in the same city. We were actually in separate states, so we had to be over the phone. Uh, but we are excited about that. I don't know if you know this uh, uh, about Clancy Hayes, but he is actually, uh, he moves in the prophetic. Uh, when we came back that fall, the fall of 2007, we had been dating a short time. Uh, Katie was still trying to figure out, are we able to hold hands in public? What do we do? Uh, and, you know, if you have met Clancy, uh, he says all sorts of things. And so we walked in. I don't even know what it was for or why. There probably wasn't a reason other than us just walking into uh, the Schaefer Center. And he looked at us, greeted us, and in our very short time of dating then goes, you know, if you two ever have children, you're going to have beautiful children. And it came to pass. We got married, and we've got two beautiful kids with another on the way. Um, but we, we've had a great relationship with Southwestern and many of the people that have been there. We know some of you because of our relationship with Southwestern uh, and being in the district for a while. Uh, Pastor Skip said, you know, I'm from Kansas originally. I grew up just a few minutes away from the University of Kansas. So I am not a Longhorn fan. I'm not an Aggie fan. Uh, and I'm not apologetic. I am a Jayhawk fan. Uh, I grew up getting to go to some Chiefs games, so I'm not a Cowboys fan. Uh, and some of you are in the middle of changing for yourself anyway. Come to the Chiefs side. Uh, but we grew up up there. But there's a few things I know that we uh, all should be able to agree on. A few years ago, I learned to love coffee. Uh, I didn't drink coffee. I came from a family where my parents didn't drink coffee, and so it just wasn't a part of our daily life. And about seven years ago, and it was perfect timing, right before the children came, I discovered good coffee, and I was going, oh, well, if this is what coffee is supposed to taste like, then I can like it. 
And since then, I've just enjoyed all sorts of coffee. Uh, I, I remember when we got our, our first coffee uh, shop here in town, and now we've got four of them. Uh, I don't know how we sustain it in town, but we do. And then the other thing I think we can agree on is I really enjoy good barbecue. Uh, coming from near Kansas City and now moving to Texas, uh, I mean, what else besides barbecue can we all agree on, right? Uh, and so those are some things that uh, a little bit about me, obviously, we'll get to know each other more as time goes on. But let's jump into the word for today. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse 7. 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse 7. And it says this, little children... Let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Now, what I like to do when I preach, when I teach, is to start with the verse, start with the passage, and then kind of uh, begin to take a step back and to better understand the context. And a lot of that comes from, uh, you know, Southwestern continues to teach good Bible study, good founded Bible study. They don't teach, uh, you know, feel, you know, how to preach a feel-good sermon. They, they teach you how to preach a biblically-based, Jesus-centric sermon, and how when you study the Bible, how to find the actual meaning, how to find the actual understanding that God intended for us to get from the Bible, as opposed to to impose your own emotions, uh, to get your own uh, feelings in, uh, in, in line with it. And so uh, I also remember that, um, you know, Dr. Bartell always told us that if he ever found us to not be preaching in the con in biblical context, good biblical context, he would find us. I don't remember what would happen when he found us, uh, but that's kind of the scary part is I remember he, he would always say, now, now that you have been taught, if I ever catch you, preaching out of context or teaching out of context, I am going to find you. And I know he will because he runs around town and he's got the endurance. So you're not going to outrun him. You're not going to hide from him uh, because he hears from the Holy Spirit and he's got the endurance to, to get wherever you are. And so uh, I, I'm always aware of that. Uh, but in reality, it, it is just uh, that when God speaks to you and gives you a word and you begin to study and you allow him to speak to you and then you allow him to speak through you, I believe uh, that, that God is still moving today through preachers around the world. And so I'm excited uh, to be able to continue to do this uh, in my calling and in this scripture, 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, uh, we're going to just kind of break it down just a little bit. But this, it starts with little children. Uh, it starts with these first two words, little children. Uh, we've got to recognize who we are in God, and that's part of what John is doing here. He uses this phrase, little children, or, or, or the phrase children multiple times throughout his writings. And here it's clear that he's writing to the church. He's not writing to unbelievers, but when he's saying little children, it's a, hey, recognizing that this is to those that are the children of God, those that are the sons and daughters of God. And uh, those people that are the sons and daughters of God are those that have experienced salvation and are following following his ways. And I believe that God is a pretty clear God. I, I don't believe that God ever intends uh, and to make things difficult to understand. I don't believe that God created gray areas for us to wonder about. I believe that when you study the Bible and you study it in context, that most of it's pretty black and white. It's pretty clear what God intended to say. And if we will draw out from it what God intended uh, when he put it into the writer's hearts as they wrote, then we don't have to wonder about who we are in God or what it looks like to be sons and daughters of God. I believe that mankind has confused the things of God. Though. It is supposed to be easy to know who is a child of God and who isn't. And we all know in today's society that uh, it's getting more and more confusing, right? They're trying to create a gray area because they want the scripture to fit their own motives as opposed to change their motives to fit that of scripture, which is the basis uh, of our faith there. Uh, the society in the world, it's trying to make it difficult for us to see those that are the children of God and those that just want to use the name but not follow the ways. 
And don't get me wrong, there must be emotion attached with it, right? We have to have emotion. There's going to be emotion. When we have our salvation experience, it's emotion filled because God is doing such a great work in us. But we can't allow the emotions that we have uh, to distract us or to distort the biblical truths. And oftentimes in today's society, that is a lot of what happens because the emotions uh, don't allow them to simply take God's word at his word. And so we have gray areas that begin to get created, uh, created, and then we begin to have confusion in the church. We have confusion in the teaching. We have people that they don't know how to study the word of God, and so they just kind of pick and choose and make it fit the idea that they have behind it. And they haven't done enough study to understand that what they're doing is twisting and manipulating the word of God. And, and I believe that God intended for it to be very easy for us to understand, but most people don't want to take the time to understand. They don't want to take the time to develop the relationship with God enough to be able to read the word and then hear him speak to us and speak to our hearts and help the, the, the Holy Spirit to help us understand what it is that we are reading and studying. I believe that God makes clear in the scriptures what is right and wrong in his sight. I believe that God is holy, and I believe that he is the only one able to establish and maintain what is sin and what is not. But we can only come to that conclusion when we come to a right understanding and approach to studying the Bible. We are not capable of making such decisions by ourselves because we ourselves are not holy, we ourselves are not righteous. Only he is. And we understand that the more that we read. Now, let's go back and let's read a little bit broader passage here uh, you know, because that was such you know, a short amount of Scripture. We need a little bit more. Uh, we'll start in 1 John uh, chapter 2. We'll start in verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Let's take a break. Everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Everyone who practices righteousness is a child of God. Everyone who practices righteousness is a co-heir with Christ. Everyone who practices righteousness has the eternal hope to spend eternity with God in heaven. Let's continue to pick it back up uh, in chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, children of God are called in verse 28, chapter 2, verse 28, there to abide in him, to abide in God, to abide in his spirit. And, and that's another sermon for another day. But here in uh, chapter 3, verse 6, John says that no one who abides in him, being Christ, keeps on sinning. And so that's where it is supposed to be black and white for us today. It has continued to be black and white with scripture, but we want to twist it for today. The reality is we should know who the children of God are based on their character and their actions. If they are continuing in sin, then they are not children of God. We are afraid to say those things today, and I understand with cancel culture and everything else going on, uh, you know, people are, are kind of weary. They want to say it in a nice way. Uh, but the thing is, with God, it's black and white. It's clear. It's here. And it's not just here. It's in many other places. Those that keep on sinning, it says they're of the devil. They're not of God. 
But what we will find is those that are children of God or us ourselves, when we've had that salvation experience and we continue to abide in him and allow him to abide in us. Later on, it talks about the seed of God abiding in those that are his children. What we find is it's difficult to sin because God's presence is in us. And because God's presence is in us, sin is not able to abound because we know those two things contrast each other they're not able to be in the same place at the same time god is not going to be is going to fill you if you're sinning he's not going to fill you if you're sinning continuing to sin because we're making a choice i'm a person i believe firmly that we have free will we don't serve a puppet master we serve a god that loves us that desires to be in relationship with us but he doesn't force us to do anything good or bad But what he does do is he loves us. And as we experience that love and as that love fills us up, we naturally just change. Now, in our pursuit of God, we find ourselves abiding in him. At least we should, right? That should be the expectation. The children of God are different than the world. And that's mentioned in 1 John 3, 1. They don't understand God, so they won't understand us because we're more like him as we pursue him. As we learn to abide in him, we will continue to stand in amazement and in wonder of God's love for us. There will be a growing appreciation for the fact that uh, God's love is expressed to human beings, that we are included in his family, that we have been grafted in, that we have been brought in, we have been adopted into the family of God. That love, that understanding, that appreciation should grow and not be stagnant because the love of God is never ending and it's not something that we'll fully comprehend here on this earth. But as we get to know him more and as we abide in him, that appreciation will grow. God's love is in stark contrast to the love of the world. The world loves those who love them while God loves everyone even if they disobey him children of God who abide in him have become more like him and will love everyone even if they don't express love back to us and that's one of the things that will stand out as we are able to stand in love because God's love fills us even if we feel like we should be offended we're able to stand in love as children of God we fully recognize who God is and what Jesus has done. And we know that our hope is in him and no one else. And as we do that, and as we continue to recognize who God actually is as the creator that created us, and we begin to have a deeper understanding of that love that God has for us as individuals and us as his creations, it will allow us to live his love out in our lives. And that in turn is going to be a testimony of what God has done in our lives that will show others that we are not only children of God, but actually it will draw others to God because of that love that works through us. The contrast of a child of God or a child of the devil is here in the passage, and we we read that in verse 10. John makes clear that anyone who continues to defy God and his standards is of the devil and not a child of God. And in today's society, we want to include everybody. We know that God loves everybody and God wants everybody to be in his family. God wants everybody to be in heaven. We know that. But not everybody makes that choice. And if they don't make that choice, and we can't make that for them, I tell this to the youth, that, 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 that you know, we have to make our own choice. It's not uh, our, our parents' salvation. It's not our parents' or our grandparents' relationship with Jesus that's going to get you to heaven. It is our own personal choice to choose Jesus and then choose to abide in his presence and grow your relationship with him that is going to sustain your faith as you grow and as you grow older. Those who have come to God through true repentance of their sins are changed people. They don't stay the same. You don't have a true encounter with God in one moment and go back and live the same way. It's not possible to have a real encounter with God and leave the same. 
An encounter with God will change your life because it's contrary to the way that we lived before. It's contrary to the way that the world wants us to live. And then there's, you know, we are torn because we have flesh and because we know that there is the devil that's coming against us. But if we will abide in God, we will be able to sustain our faith. Those who have come to God through true repentance of their sins are changed people. They don't keep on sinning because they practice righteousness. True children of God are characterized by a love for God that is shown by following his commandments, not because we have to, but because we understand and we feel his love, so we want to obey and abide by his commands, and we show true concern for the spiritual and physical needs of others. Children of God don't do good works to earn God's love. We do good works because God's love has been extended to us through his grace. We do good works and pursue him because he loved us first, because he sought us first. We don't do it to earn his love. And that's one of the things that stands out. This world is so used to working for everything. And we do need to work. Amen. We've got to work, uh, but uh, it is in contrast even to the, the religions around the world that are so focused on what I do is going to decide what I become. What I do is going to decide where I end up. And with God, he's saying, look, the work has already been done. Just come along, come on in and, and, and be able to uh, 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 get the grace and then live in the love and abide in the love. And as that happens, all of the change in the life, it's a natural change. I'm a person, I believe that the fruit of the Spirit isn't something that we should have to work on or work hard for. If we're abiding in God, if we're abiding in God, the the fruit of the Spirit is really just a byproduct of the God that's inside of us. And it's just a natural, uh, a physical manifestation of the spiritual transformation that is inside. Uh, We've got to move on. I've got to get to other points here, right? We've got to have three points for a good sermon. Uh, The second thing we find in this passage is let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. So little children, recognizing who we are in Christ, who we are in God. And the second one, do not be deceived. And again, he's not talking to those that are already living in deception, right? Because prior to Christ, we live in deception and and misunderstanding and and, uh, no understanding of who God is. But as God reveals himself, then we're able to understand that we have lived in deception and sin. And now we are to not live or be deceived anymore. In in 1 John, we find that John is writing against uh, what was back then the Gnostics. Uh, who denied the reality of the Lord's humanity as well as his deity. Uh, What we find in John's epistles, that there are powerful teachings against such heresies, but we don't know that unless we actually read the Bible. Uh, Not just for then, but even for now, it helps us in defending our faith against all of the heresy and the, the poor teaching that is coming out even today that is much more prevalent because it's easier to get out to everyone uh, today. Uh, The letter is closely related to John's gospel. They both concern the Lord Jesus and the eternal life that comes with those who trust in him. The gospel gives the declaration of salvation while the letter the assurance of it. The gospel gives the declaration of salvation while the letter, the assurance of it. They both speak of the word, which is the term used for Christ as the revealer of God. The vocabulary of the books are similar, uh, such as at the very beginning, it says beginning. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. You see words like witness, believe, eternal life, love, abide, and others. There are a lot of similarities here that we see that John uses. In John, he writes to define the nature of the person of Christ in the face of the heretical teachings that were afflicting the church near the end of the first century. And uh, Dr. Roberts on Wednesday mentioned that, you know, there are many of these false teachings and the heresies, they're, they're circular. You know, they come back over time. And it's kind of interesting that it didn't take much time at all for heresies to begin about Jesus, even there at the beginning of the church. And it all, why? Because the devil knows if he can break down the understanding and the importance of our understanding of Jesus as both God and man, then it completely dismantles everything about our faith. Because we know that the center of our faith and everything on the Bible hinges on 
Jesus. And if you can break down something about that, then you can begin to break down other parts of people's faith. And that's why we've got to understand what we believe, that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and why we believe it, so that we can defend what we believe. And if we don't do that, if we're not practicing righteousness, if we're not watching ourselves so that we're not deceived, then we don't know how to defend against the heresies. We don't know how to help our friends that are down in the dark parts of the web looking up all sorts of theories about who Jesus was or what he was or he wasn't and everything else about it. And when they begin to talk to us, we don't know how to respond because we've got that surface level faith. And I believe that if we grow in that understanding of the practicing of the righteousness, then we are able to defend the Jesus that we've experienced. So John is writing and and he says many things that help us to defend the faith. He seemed to have intended for this letter to be actually circulated among uh, churches and among different areas for teachings because the, the, the heresies affected more than just one church. It's to address the rise of false teachings about spiritual salvation through Christ and how that salvation works in believers' lives. Now, we know the general name for that teaching is Gnosticism. Uh, It's basically characterized by the idea that only spirit was good and matter was evil. Uh, And this is just a little bit of background to understand just a little bit more of what they were dealing with. Uh, In other Greek and Oriental religious systems, the Gnostics believe that one must free themselves from the material world and be occupied alone with the spirit. The way of escape for them was the way of superior knowledge, right? They didn't have Google back then, but we do. So we have the superior knowledge, right? Uh, And some people live like they have the superior knowledge because in two seconds, you can Google whatever you want and you can find whatever answer you want. And actually, you can find whatever answer you want in the way you want it to fit your argument, right? You can find one way or the other, but you can find good research on, you know, and reliable sources on whatever you want, however you want. And so uh, there are some people that they don't, wouldn't call themselves Gnostics. They wouldn't, you know, uh, attribute these things to themselves, but they do uh, feel the superiority of having more knowledge and knowing more or being able to get that knowledge and gain that knowledge. And, And so that's why they're able to argue their way into whatever. Uh, but uh, they, they feel like learning the mysterious secrets of the universe, which we can do with Google, uh, is the initiative of the cult could supposedly attain freedom, is what they were looking for, uh, uh, freedom. With regard to the teachings of Christianity, uh, the opposition of this heresy centered in the person of Christ. And we know that today there are other heresies, there are other things, there are other poor teachings, but it all has to hinge on Christ. Christ in order to change Christianity. And they'll say, well, Jesus really did affirm this, or Jesus didn't really say that. And they want to argue, they want to manipulate, they want to twist. And that's why we've got to have good, sound, biblical, founded, Jesus-centric teaching, preaching, worship, everything in the church and in the home. When one becomes aware of the prevalent false claims, many of John's statements in the first epistle take on new meaning. John combats other areas like uh, Doucetism uh, by, and if you know, one of you others pronounce it you know, more professionally, that's fine. Just go with my pronunciations. Docetism by his insistence that the reality of the humanity of Christ. Uh, he utters severe words against uh, Serinthianism by emphasizing the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And, and John is uh, over here, he is advocating for Jesus both as man and God because you've got to have both in order for everything to work together and to make sense and for the purpose of which Christ came to be actually fulfilled. This epistle should serve as a final answer to that heresy, but what we see is people still want to try to argue and come against uh, these teachings, even in the present day. The primary purpose of the epistle, as stated by John himself in uh, chapter 5, verse 13, and 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. His remarks are addressed to the children of God, those who have already 
or the begotten of God. It is a family letter, and, and the word fellowship is used by John to describe the ideal relationship between God and his children, us who have come into the family of God, not based on what we've done, because, but because God brought us in, because of what he has done. He has made a way. When we are in fellowship or we are abiding in Christ, we cannot be easily deceived. Hear that again. When we are in fellowship or we are abiding in Christ, we are not able to be easily deceived because we are able to discern spirits. We are able to discern teachings. But we're not able to do that if we don't know what the scriptures say. We're not able to do that if we don't know what God says or who he is or how he works or his character and that's something we have a very shallow church in many areas and people that are able to be you know, taken by the waves of the storm because they're not anchored, they're not rooted, they don't have a true foundation to their faith. But when you do, you're not easily deceived. We'll be able to discern many things. God will reveal truth to those that abide in him. His desire is that all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. His desire is that the world hear and to understand there is only one way to the Father and that's through Jesus. He doesn't say maybe there's another way. There's nothing in the scriptures that would indicate something else. Jesus tells us very clearly in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me, period. There's no other way. You can't twist the scripture, yet people do. And if you're not biblically founded, if you are not abiding in Christ, there are people that believe that there are multiple ways to heaven, to God the Father. And I can tell you that they've not had good teaching or preaching. There are many teachings out there that are like good Photoshop pictures, right? Or the new CGI that's out there. If you watch any you know, new movies, I've not watched a lot recently, but I've seen you know, like the advertisements for the new Lion King movie, the, the real life or whatever they call it. You know, the animals look very real. They do a great job of animating it. And you're like, oh man, that looks so real. It looks like a real animal. You know, and then you've got like the new uh, Marvel movies and all the Avengers and all the crazy things that happen in there with them fighting the bad guys and Spider-Man swinging around the city. And it's so well done. They're so good at what they do. You're just like almost going, it's almost like there's a real person really shooting webs out and swinging around the city. It looks so good. And people have done that with the scriptures. They have photoshopped it. They have, they have masked over the truth. So the truth is there. There's really a person there, but when you understand that there's a green screen behind them and that they have imposed their own thoughts and feelings and emotions to create what they wanted as opposed to what's really there, we've got a problem because there are too many Christians that are not able to see past the fake teachings. They have truth in them, but they are deceptive. Little children, do not be deceived. Lastly, let's move on. Practice righteousness. Practice righteousness. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. True believers and followers of Christ actually practice righteousness. Not just talk about it, not just, you know, well, it's in the Bible. But true believers, true children of God, practice Righteousness, that's an action. It's something that's going on. It's not just a, oh, there's your salvation moment, and boom, you're righteous. There's an action. Uh, you know, there, there's something that's a continuous action that's going on, sanctification in our lives. It's not simply, simply attained at salvation, and then we get to just sit in the church pew for the rest of our lives. We practice righteousness because the one who dwells within us is righteous. God's righteousness is revealed in his children through their conduct, through their actions. Righteous conduct does not produce righteous character, but it reveals its presence in us. Let me say that again. Righteous conduct does not produce righteous character, but it reveals its presence in us. We don't do good things in order to produce righteousness because us by ourselves, we cannot produce righteousness because we are not righteous. 
We don't serve the church to earn a place in the Father's house. We don't act right because it'll get us closer to Jesus. I believe strongly, I said it earlier, that we are people of free will. I believe that we don't serve that puppet master that pulls the strings and makes us do things. We serve a creator who loves his creation. We serve a God who desires fellowship with each and every one of us. We, with every person outside of these walls and every person inside of these walls, God has been calling you, God has been calling them back into a right relationship with them ever since the fall in the garden. We are allowing him to do his work in our lives and to work in us and to work through us. When we come to God and practice righteousness, that means that we are being filled with the Spirit and with His love. When we practice righteousness, we are allowing God to change us from the inside out. We are seeking His will and not our own. And that's a struggle with humanity, right? Because we, we like to be in control and do everything on our own. And so the giving up of our own will in order to seek his will is something that we struggle with, but it's something that we must do. And as we do it, we'll find that giving up our will is not a bad thing. And it doesn't mean that we just uh, live a boring life or anything like that. What you actually find is the freedom that the Gnostics were looking for. We get to live in it because of the freedom that we find in Christ. Our actions, therefore, should be out of the abundance of his love that is instilled in our hearts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if his love and his righteousness, because we've practiced it, has filled our lives, our hearts, our souls, then his love will be what other people see. And we don't have to work on it, it just is. As we practice righteousness, we find that our lives will be in more and more contrast to that of the world, which in some ways creates more and more of a problem between us and the world, which in turn also creates a friction because then, uh, you know, people may even be offended or they're worried. And then we begin to question, well, am I saying the wrong thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am, am I able to speak this biblical truth without fear of someone coming against it. We're worried about hurting other people's feelings. But the reality is that we're going to come in contrast with the world naturally just because God and his spirit is in contrast with the world. But we'll also find that if we'll actually do it out of love that God has instilled in us, that it will soften the hearts of the world and it will draw them closer to Jesus. And someday the people that we pray for uh, here, and we call this the Ark of Safety, right? Uh, that The people that we're praying for here, and people like my dad just a few years ago, took years and years and years of prayer, will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Even though we don't agree on things, and we had arguments, and we had lots of other things, uh, what we will find is that people will see the character that is in us because of the work that God has done, and it will draw them to the place that they are able to say, if God is sustaining that person, if God has done that kind of a work in them, if that is who God is, then that is what I want and I understand I need. Uh, but if we're not practicing righteousness and we're not living in God's love and we're not showing God's love, then we may be showing something that people don't want and we may kind of push them away from the church instead. So act, as we practice righteousness, we will find it hard to sin. Not because we've trained ourselves not to do bad things. Sometimes, you know, it's like there's this list of things you're not supposed to do in the Bible and that's what some people want to focus on. But the reality is that if we're practicing righteousness... It's hard to sin because you're full of God's love. You're full of God. And if you're full of God, you're not going to be drawn to sin. You're going to be drawn to his love and his righteousness. And as that happens, there is a natural movement from a life of sin to a life of righteousness through Christ. 1 John 3, 8 through 10. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. 
And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. If we are truly born again believers, if we are truly children of God, we won't sin because there's no room for it because the seed of God abides in us. You know, Pastor Daniel, my uh, pastor at First Assembly in Dallas, he's, he has a saying that he'll share occasionally. I'm going to paraphrase it, uh, but there's so much truth to it. And he says, I've seen people do a lot of things in the spirit. And he grew up church of God, so he's seen a lot of people do a lot of things in the spirit. But I can promise you one thing you'll never see, and that is people sinning in the spirit. I've seen a lot of people do things in the spirit, but I can promise you one thing you'll never see, and that's someone sinning in the spirit. And that's because they contrast each other. That's because they can't be together. That's because you can't be full of God and full of the devil at the same time. You're serving one of two masters in this world. You're either serving God or you're serving the devil. It is pretty black and white. We don't like it. If we're honest with ourselves, it'd be great if we could just kind of do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and do what we like and don't do what we don't like. But the reality is that if we're a child of God, we're called to live under his roof and under his guidance, under his law, under his love. 1 John 5, 18 through 21. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and the eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. John does this multiple times through this particular book, but in other areas and other parts of the New Testament, there's so many areas that it's just, it's clear. It's black and white. It's right in front of us. Sometimes we gloss over it because we don't like it. Sometimes we gloss over it because we don't understand it. But the longer we abide in Christ, the longer that we stay in his teaching, the longer that we pursue God in our daily walk, we will have a better and very clear understanding of what God wants us to know about him he's not hiding he's not holding something back some people want to act like God's well he's just you know he's told us like this little bit and then you know he's holding this stuff back we're not going to know everything till we get to heaven because that will be when we see him as he is as the scripture said earlier but we know that the spirit searches the deep things of God and we know that he sent the spirit after Jesus ascended and if he sent the spirit who is here to help us, to, to, to empower us, to speak to us, to comfort us, to counsel us. If he sent that same spirit that searches the deep things of God, then that means God wants to reveal the deep things of himself to us, but he can't do that if we're living in sin. And so we must abide in him so that we understand the deep things of God. And those deep things don't have to be difficult things. And actually, they become easier and easier to understand and to live by the closer we are to God, the more we practice righteousness. Some of us have lived long enough to have practiced righteousness and practiced unrighteousness, right? And some of us have lived long enough to practice stagnation in the middle of that. But we won't go there today. 1 John 3, 6 you know, John is telling us, uh, and he's, he doesn't mean that people are going to automatically cease all sinful behavior. You know, if you've lived long enough, you know that too, after they become believers. But 1 John 3, 6 says, no one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Instead, he means that they, don't, uh, that they do not deliberately continue sinful patterns because they trust Christ's work on the cross that defeated sin's power. They also confess their sins to God and receive forgiveness, allowing for God and other believers to help them overcome sin. As he says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the, the, the one of the keys there is the practicing righteousness and abiding in Christ that allows us to sustain the faith, that allows us to live in righteousness. The inward spiritual work of God in our life will manifest in an outward physical way. 
not because we make it happen, but because we live it out with the Spirit. I firmly believe that we don't have to try to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. I said this earlier. We don't have to try to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I've just got to try to love them more. I've just got to try to have more patience. I've just got to try to... I mean, you're going to have to work on yourself. We all do. We all have our shortcomings, right? But if we're abiding in Christ, all of that is going to naturally change. Because if we have been grafted into the family of God, if we have been brought into that that root system, then we are being fed the love of God. We are being filled with that nutrition. And if you're being filled with that, fruit's just going to come. It's going to happen. We don't have to try to love others around us. It'll be a natural part of our changed character. Our ability to abide in the Spirit, I believe, is directly tied to our daily choice to practice righteousness. Pastor mentioned uh, choices last week. Not mentioned. He preached on choices last week. If you heard it, if you didn't, go back and listen to it online. But I believe firmly that we have free will and we get to choose every day what we do. Are we going to serve God and practice righteousness? Or are we going to serve the devil and serve ourselves and practice lawlessness? It's a choice that we make daily. Some of us, we, we don't want that choice. And I understand there are days I don't, I don't want the, uh, you know, uh, to have to make a choice, right? I'd like someone else to make that choice for me. But I'm in control of myself. I'm in control of how close I get to God or how far away I run from God. Practicing righteousness is a choice every day when we wake up. When we choose to practice righteousness, we will be confident in who we are as a child of God. When we choose to practice righteousness, we will not be easily deceived by the world and the heresies that surround us. When we choose to practice righteousness, we will live for God in a way that can only be done because of him and not because of ourselves. We made a choice to choose to practice righteousness, but that is allowing God to move and change us. So this morning, I want to make a couple of petitions to you because I don't know you, you don't know me, and that's all right. We'll get to know each other more. But I don't know if there might be someone here that would say that this morning that you haven't chosen Jesus ever before. And you'd say this morning, uh, I don't even know Jesus, so I, there's no way for me to practice righteousness. I, I don't even know how to get away from the things of the world. I don't know these things. But this morning, maybe you're here, and you uh, feel a drawing uh, of the Spirit in your soul that there is something, and it's God's love reaching out to you and working on your heart. And maybe you're here and you've served God before, but maybe it's been a while since you've really actually practiced the righteousness and lived for God and you have been practicing lawlessness and you have ran from God. I don't know where you stand, but this morning God is faithful and just to forgive and uh, reaffirm that salvation in your life and realign your life and rework what has been done before if you choose to allow him to. So I'm going to ask with everybody's heads bowed, eyes closed. If this morning you need to experience the love of God, you need to experience forgiveness in your life for the first time, or maybe you need God to come and forgive you. You've ran from God. You're not living for him. You know where you stand with him. And this morning you say, it's time to get right. It's time to be right with God and start living right. I'm going to simply ask that you lift your hand. I'm going to give an opportunity. Well, I'm going to ask everybody to go ahead and stand with me. Glad to know that everybody in here is in good standing with God. But I believe that maybe there's some here that you're in good standing with God, but we're not practicing righteousness. We're not practicing daily. We're not pursuing God. We're in right standing. We're there, but we're not 
continuing the pursuit of that relationship and growing it. So I want to pray over you this morning before we're dismissed because I believe that as we as a church, we as a people, pursue God, practice righteousness, it will sustain the church and it will also allow us to reach out to others with a great testimony of who God is and what he's done and draw others into this place. Lord, we love you this morning. God, I thank you that we're able to be here in a, in, a, in a church, in a place, in a city, in a country that we can come and we can freely worship you. We can freely have your word preached from a pulpit with a microphone. We have an opportunity that some others around the world don't have. I thank you, Lord, that we have so many freedoms. And in you, we have freedom to choose what we do with our life. We have freedom to choose to pursue you or not. And I pray that this morning, God, that you would begin to stir up faith once again to believe that you are working on behalf of the church. Stir up faith for us to believe that, Lord, you do have a plan for our lives. And as we pursue you, that plan will unfold. Our destiny will begin to be placed in front of us because, God, you will speak. For those in this room that maybe it's been a while since they have heard your voice, God, I pray as they begin to pursue you, as they begin to practice righteousness more and more every day, that the, uh, they would hear your voice more clearly than they have ever heard before, that would direct them, not just for their future, but for the day, the day in and the day out, where we are supposed to be led by your spirit in everything that we do, that as we draw close to you and you draw close to us, we would have a deeper understanding and appreciation every day for your love for us, even if we have been saved and serving the church for 50 years, Lord, your love for us has not it's not changed, but our understanding of your love deepens. And as that happens, Lord, I pray that there would just be an outward manifestation of your love that is deep within us. And as we pursue you, Lord, that people around this city, around this county, in our workplaces would see the daily change as we become more like Christ in our actions and our words because we allow you to be ruler and king of our hearts. We allow you to lead us and guide us, direct our paths in all that we do. So Lord, we thank you for the work that you've done. We thank you for the work that you are doing right now here today. And I thank you, Lord, for the work that is going to happen later today and tomorrow and the next day as each day we choose to pursue God. We choose to practice righteousness so that our faith may be sustained and never waver with Jesus as the center of it all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you did on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you made a way. Thank you, Lord, that it's not based on what we can do, but it's based on what you have already done. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know the exact phrase that Pastor Gerald, oh, you've got notes? Oh, well, there we go. I'm, I'm going to, this isn't like school. This isn't cheating to get his notes. If you'll raise your right hand for the pastoral blessing. May you be blessed physically. May God bless you spiritually. May God bless you emotionally. May God bless you financially. May God bless you relationally. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, be blessed, and we'll see you all on Wednesday for Bible study.